Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, up next, it's a pleasure to welcome Alfred Tu presenting Visualizing Density Levels. Um, just a quick reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box. If you see questions that you like, use that thumbs up. Um, Alfred has worked on housing issues in California at the state and local level with organizations such as California Democratic Renters, Renters Council, East Bay for Everyone, and was recently appointed to the Berkeley Planning Commission. We welcome Alfred. When you're ready, let Chelsea know. Okay, thank you. All right, do you all see the slides? Yeah. Be sure. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Alfred here in Berkeley in the Bay Area. I'm gonna talk a bit about visualizing density and by that both looking at what does the thousand units per acre actually look like and also looking at how do we use art to show what this idea of high density living could actually be like. And I think many of the speakers before I've talked about so many of the benefits of higher density living. And I think the biggest one is really about the convenience, about not needing to get in a car to go places, not even needing to wait for the bus to go somewhere, but just being able to go downstairs and everything you need, all the people you wanna see are right there. You can think about it almost like if you were going to a convention where everything's all centrally located. Uh, so we often think about how cities used to be really lively places in the past with the downtowns and the main streets and wonder why isn't it that way today? And often we try to recreate those main streets and downtowns with the same low and mid-rise buildings. And we find it's kind of empty. And the reason for that is people live in more spacious buildings than we used to in the past. Whereas a hundred years ago, when people were crammed into whole families in a room, you might have enough people on Main Street or on downtown to support all the businesses downstairs. But nowadays, because our living standards have increased, there are not as many people. And therefore, a lot of the businesses no longer have enough customers to stay in business. And that's why it's necessary if we want to have those lively neighborhoods to have larger buildings so that we can have enough people live there to support the business, but also live in more spacious, less cramped conditions than people did 100 years ago. Uh, so what I've shown here on this slide, you see amount of retail space, amount of office space, and amount of apartment space a family might need. And you can see that the apartments, the housing is the bulk of the space in any city is the housing. When we look at a thousand homes per acre, it really depends on what types of homes they are. Are they studio apartments? Are they three bedrooms? But let's take an average. Let's say that the average unit is maybe a two bedroom unit. Some are larger, some are smaller. And that works out to anywhere from 500,000 to a million plus square feet of housing space. And if you divide that by an acre, you get what is called a floor area ratio of 11 to 30. And what floor area ratio means is you divide the number of square feet in a building by the number of square feet on the land. So for example, a one-story building that covers the entire piece of land has a floor area ratio of one. And a two-story building that covers half a lot also has a floor area ratio of one. Uh, in practice, most buildings do not cover the whole lot because you still need space for yards, for the windows to face into. 
And so when we talk about a thousand homes per acre and the floor area ratio of 11 to 30, the actual height of the buildings will be taller than that. We're talking 20 to 50 story buildings. And as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, over the years, we've gone through many different ideas of how high rise buildings should be located. Uh, I often say that uh, the sequence that technology is invented and made commercialized is really important. It, there's only about 50 years between the invention of the elevator and invention of the automobile. And in between that time, New York City was built. And if the sequence had gone the other way, it may never have happened. But anyway, originally, as elevators became popular, lots of tall buildings went downtown, which was very convenient. But people complained about the noise, about the lack of greenery. And so in reaction to that, there was the era of the towers in the park, which is very car-centered and actually not very dense at all. And so even though the buildings were big and tall, there actually weren't that many people living there. There weren't enough people to support businesses. And it was kind of unpleasant to get around, as you can see in this picture. More recently today, we've seen what I call the towers in the block. This is very common in a lot of cities where industrial areas are redeveloped as residential places. And you see these large buildings that take up a whole block and they have a tower on each corner. And there is some green space, usually it's private in the middle of the building for the residents. And this is a major improvement over the towers in the park. You see this in Vancouver, it was an example of the uh, townhouses in front of the high rise buildings. It's still not perfect though. One of the downsides is because these are designed as a whole block, there are not too many places where you can fit something like that. And you also run into the issue of a single owner where it gets into the issue where it, maybe it is just investors that own these giant blocks and there's not opportunities for individuals to participate in building their neighborhood and having an ownership of it. And so that's what brings me to the idea of towers in the village. And what that really means is you think about uh, the old style village or the old style main street where you have lots of small buildings. You've got maybe market stalls in the street. You've got small parks and just plugging a couple of towers in there. <laughs> so going back to the towers in the park and the importance of filling out, using out all the block instead of just some of it is that right now in China, we see a lot of these high rise towers in the park. While in the United States, we often see these five story buildings and they actually work out to about the same number of apartments for a given plot of land. And looking at high rise housing, we've seen that actually for the auto focus on places like Singapore and Hong Kong, the United States in cities like New York and San Francisco and Miami have actually gotten higher densities and more people and more homes on each block, in large part because we use the whole block. So even if the towers don't take up the whole block, they're still surrounded by these smaller mid-rise buildings as opposed to large areas of empty space or parking lot. And uh, these types of buildings in San Francisco do reach that thousand homes per acre in our downtown areas. The main challenge we have right now isn't that we can't build a thousand homes per acre, it's that we're not doing it in enough places to meet the number of people who are living in our cities. Okay, so now we're gonna look a little closer at towers in the village and also a few different 
artistic styles and uh, different ways of illustrating buildings that can be useful as you bring these ideas back to your communities. So the idea here is you've got a fairly common city lot or a suburban lot. I've used the example from Los Angeles where the standard lots are about 50 feet wide and 150 feet deep. And you combine a couple of them and you have a high rise on it. But the key thing is the high rise doesn't come all the way up to the street. Instead, it's hidden behind some smaller buildings. And that helps a lot in what the experience at the street level is. Uh, and then another way to show buildings is what I call the bird's eye view. And this is where you're looking at it from above at an angle. It's good for kind of showing the entire thing because at the bird's eye view, you can see pretty much the whole building. It's not hidden behind anything. So this is great for more technical diagrams. Of course, though, it can feel a bit impersonal because you're looking at everything from so far away and the actual interesting parts of the building, like the front door or the name of the store that's on the first floor, you can't really see at this scale. Uh, one thing I really like to do is illustrating ideas for buildings and cities is the cross section, because this shows that what the purpose of a building is, the, the space inside of it. And both in the three-dimensional cross-section as well as the two-dimensional cross-section, it's a really great way to bring it to life here. You can see into people's apartments. You can see somebody's got a dinosaur statue in one. You can see people watching the movie. You can see people eating at a restaurant. You can see these market stalls in the alleys between the buildings. I found that the sections really bring people to get people excited about the building. It's almost like a children's book where people are starting to look around and trying to find all the Easter eggs on the page. The other nice thing about showing it in section is it sidesteps the issue of the architectural style. Different people have different opinions. Some people like modern buildings. Some people like more historical inspired styles. If you draw the building in section, it can be whatever people imagine it to be. And then uh, even more important, I would say, is the street level view. Just ultimately, that's what we see. And it's also a great way to highlight everything that's at the ground level, which is by far the most important part of any building, as others have mentioned. And going back to the idea of the tower in the village is that, as you can see here, at the very street level, you've got, you've got the market stalls, you've got the tiny houses. And these could be things that are owned by different people. And then the next level back, you have the maybe three to four story buildings, the classic Main Street style. And then only behind that are the taller parts of the building. So at the street level, I would say the majority of what people see is that first floor through third floor. And then, of course, the showing the inside of buildings is also very important as that's the that's where we spend most of our time. <laughs> and one thing about the taller buildings is that there's opportunity for more spaces inside. You can have these atriums inside. And then finally, there's also the floor plan or site plan. And this is almost like a map. And it's great because it's a great way of showing all the different things that are in a building and different things that people can experience. 
And I think in the case of the idea of powers in the village, emphasizing that you have different owners and it's not this big block development that happens all at once, but something that happens incrementally one piece at a time. And above all, I would say, have fun with the visualizations. I think that often in architecture, there's this very standard, very slick style. You see these reflective buildings, everything's just a little bit too clean. And I think that often among architects, we say, oh, that looks really cool. And however, for the general public, it can come off a bit too cold. And I think that it's important that we put some, some more whimsical and more colorful in our visualizations of what density looks like. And now I'm going to actually show you some of the paintings and drawings I've done. Uh, Chelsea, can you spotlight my camera? It looks like you're in speaker view as long as you're speaking. Great. Okay. So the actual drawings I did were only about uh, letter size, like eight and a half by 11. And these were done with uh, a technical pen, like an ink pen, and then watercolor. And one thing I've found useful is using just a couple of colors here to highlight different things. For example, in these illustrations, the green is trees and orange are businesses. And it's, a, it, it's quick and it points the attention to the things you want to focus on. And then some of the other things I've found great is using the acrylic painting. And acrylic painting I like because it's very colorful and, and it's very, these very deep and rich colors. And I think that's the very successful people who often look at and say, oh, I, I, love, I love the picture. Or that seems like a great place to, that I want to live. So with that, I think I'll take some questions. Alfred, thank you so much. Your work is incredible. Thank you for sharing it with us. It's also incredibly inspiring. Um, so, and I love, of course, the idea that we don't have to be cookie cutter and that we should add some whimsy. So um, Evan, I'm gonna toss it to you. Do we have questions for Alfred? Yes, thank you, Lynn. And Alfred, thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have a few questions. The first one is, uh, first off, just compliments that you have some beautiful work and is wondering how can we encourage more architects and designers to think this creatively, create, creatively like you do? Uh, so I would say a great way for architects and designers to get more creative is to also explore other forms of art. Before I did architecture, I had been drawing comics and cartoons for a long time. And that that was kind of my both an introduction to architecture, but also helped me develop this more powerful style that really focuses on the characters and the people as opposed to the buildings themselves. Great, thank you. Uh, another question we have, uh, Person says housing density is often a very scary idea for many people. Uh, have you found that your drawings are able to uh, make it less scary and more approachable for most people? Yeah, definitely. I would say that you want to make it, you want to bring it to life. That's because I think that's what often scares people is they see a building, they think density and they think of a lot of the modernist towers in the park where you just look out the window and it's a big gray wall with a thousand windows on it. And yeah, there's not really any life to it. But 
I, that's why I found the cross sections to be so appealing every time I show people. People always get excited about the cross sections because then they look inside and they see, oh, there are people who live in this building and they have the differences in what they, how they use their space, what they do. Great. Uh, we have another person asking, um, what do you think about uh, yourself and other architects being able to handle issues of global warming or climate change and incorporating those topics into your work? Sure. So, yeah, often it's mentioned that uh, one of the big things about climate change is that we're going to need to reduce the energy use in transportation. And so I think that's a big reason behind the density. But I think there's also a lot about one of the reasons for newer buildings is that newer buildings can be more energy efficient in the buildings themselves. And apartment buildings, because they have the shared walls, they are also more efficient to heat and cool. And also, as we are talking about them having to deal with stronger storms and other things, there's definitely a need to shift towards stronger forms of construction, such as these larger concrete buildings, as opposed to wood frame houses, which often are not strong enough to stand up to some of the impacts of climate change. Yeah, I mean, imagine, I imagine that in your work, you are much closer to kind of what these projects obviously are going to look like than the rest of us. We're more the I guess theoretical, but you're kind of the visionary and the one who's able to to be really face to face with these. Uh, in that process, have you found in the process of exploring different levels of density, have you found that there's an ideal level of it or what uh, looks the best to you or what you envision being the ideal? Is it a thousand? Is it a different number? Uh, I think there's a whole range of ideals. And I would say that once you get to about 30 units per acre, that's when it really starts to feel like you're living in a town as opposed to the suburban model visually. And then anything really beyond that, the buildings get taller in the background, but what the experience is at the ground level doesn't really necessarily need to change that much. And I think that's why often I illustrate these buildings the emphasis is on the first couple of floors looking a little bit different than the upstairs that really show that the downstairs where the businesses are, where you feel connected to the street, that part is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting actually. So at the, at the bottom floor, there's almost no difference between 800 or 1,000 units per acre just, unless you just look up, I guess, right? Right, I, it, it's, it's like if you, when you're go, walking down the street in the city, you focus on the signs, you focus on the people. There might be, if there are trees on the street, you really don't see too much beyond the third floor. Yeah, all right, we, we have another question. Um, it's more about the, the process of, uh, oh, sorry, we'll ask this one first. So someone's asking, do you have any advice on bridging the, the gap or the bridging the divide between folks who are looking for more historical and nostalgic streetscapes and uh, those who want more of a futuristic urban environment? Yeah, I think there's a place for both. And I think the important thing is to keep the project smaller so that you don't have a whole block where it's just one building. That's how you really get the variety. And that's in having a greater variety of land ownership. Moving away from that model where one company builds the whole block towards one where maybe a quarter of the block is a large building, but then you've got some existing buildings that are owned by different people or they might be owned by a nonprofit or by the city. That, that's the kind of variety that really makes cities interesting and also avoids 
having this very monotonous architecture. All right, thank you. We have time for one or two more questions, uh, one of which is focusing on your process. So can you explain about or give an example of what this process looks like when you are with a client or community who wants you to do some work uh, of architecture and, and how you go about translating that to graphics from your mind? Sure. So uh, for most of these pictures that I've been showing, these are not any actual project. These are more prepared for a lot of the political work I do where we're just trying to sell people an idea of, well, since there are no examples of very large buildings yet in your area, what could it possibly look like? And then once you get to the actual, when the actual design of buildings, this tends to be a lot more technical and uh, it tends to be not often, not necessarily as fun and interesting that I think so much of it was what we're trying to do here with the thousand homes per acre is uh, about telling the story of what does that even look like. <laughs> I like that last part you, you say about telling a story. Um, so speaking kind of a, along that same line of thought, someone's asking, you know, are there any actual real life developments or cities that you really enjoy and are inspired by in your own work? Uh, sure, I think that I really like a lot of the historic downtowns in a lot of cities, both large and small, just because there is so much variety and you have the smaller lots. And uh, yeah, and I, personally, I feel that uh, off, that we could learn a lot from bringing back some of the ornamentation and decoration to the buildings, even if it's just on the lower floors, because that really keeps the buildings more interesting. Awesome. Well, uh, Alfred, there are a lot of people asking to see uh, more examples of your work, so I'm glad you put the link in the chat. Uh, but since we're running out of our time, Lynn, do you want to take it back over? We're all riveted. Thank you again, Alfred. It was so great having you. Um, thanks everyone for their questions. All great questions. I think that there, yeah, if everyone looks, um, there's more images that um, Alfred dropped in the chat. So 